topic that I don't think any, I don't think too many people give enough attention to. A lot of people sort of skimp through that, and I don't think our book adequately covers it. So I'm going to spend some time talking about that today. But let's bring up the example from last week. I kind of felt like I rushed through the last parts of that, so I want to sort of rewind and hit the highlights again. What are all the different ways that browsing a website on a mobile device is different than um, browsing it on a computer? Did we talk about this on? Want to say? Okay. All right. Well, let's summarize that then. Smaller screen device, likely to be slower bandwidth, so the the download speed is likely to be smaller. Um, you interact with the, with the device in a different way. That is, instead of using a mouse to click on links, typically you use your finger to, to, hit, to, to touch a link. Instead of having a physical keyboard, although that's not true in, in all cases. In some mobile devices, you do have a physical keyboard, but it's still different. It's not a, one that you can type with on with all uh, ten fingers. Um, and probably the, the, and those are sort of the obvious ones. So we think about things like not, not putting links too closely together for a mobile device, you know. Um, so the less obvious one is the fact that people are likely to use a mobile website for different reasons than they would a desktop website. In other words, some people, you know, surf the web and go to sites they like, you know, and browse it for the fun of it. Um, and, and they can sort of get immersed in the site. If they're a fan of a particular movie or TV show or whatever, they'll spend a long time on a site devoted to that. Typically, that's not what you get when, you, when you're browsing a site via a mobile device. Typically, with a mobile device, you're very focused and looking at getting the answer to something. All right? So, simplicity is the key in mobile web development. All right? That's why we're taking what's called a mobile-first approach. Simplicity ought to be important in even a full-blown website, right? But it's especially important when we talk about a mobile website. So what we're going to do is we're going to design a website first the way we sort of want it to look on a mobile device. And then we're going to add things on to make it and maybe add some enhancements on uh, extra content, um, a, a more elaborate design to work on a desktop. And that was the example that we left off on last time. I think um, I showed the example, but I don't think we really spent too much time on the details of the example. The main principles at work when we talk about doing a responsive web design are using percentages for sizes of everything. So we're not going to use an absolute number of pixels for the size of anything. Nor are we going to use it for images or, or for sections of our page or whatever. The other one is that we're going to use media queries. And what media queries are, are a way of telling the browser, under these conditions, apply this style sheet. And media queries go back to the beginning of CSS. Some pages have different print style sheets than if you view them on the screen. So if you view it on the screen, you get one thing, maybe a little more elaborate design. But if you're printing it out, they may eliminate like background images or whatever, just because you, those don't really come off very well on the printer. So let's go and look at the example we had from last time. This is called progressive enhancement because you start out with the base and progressively you add stuff onto it. And you, okay, thanks. And we're just going to do it for two sorts of devices. We're just going to do it for a mobile device and for a desktop device. But actually, you could do progressive enhancement where you make a tablet look different than a mobile phone 
and a tablet looked different than a desktop device. It's just the same sort of thought process that's maybe extended a little bit, but we're going to do a simpler case. So in this example, we see we have our page. We're going to view, all right, and if we notice a couple things about it, number one, it has an image on it, it has a background image on it, and it has a three-column layout. Now, I'm going to have to download the Opera mobile emulator, take a second here. So I can test this and see what it's going to look like on a mobile device. Well, this wasn't too painful. I feared it would be a longer install. So we can emulate a HTC Hero, which I picked because it's a particularly small uh, phone. Launch it. I can go and copy this address into my emulator. And there we see it looks different. It looks different. It has a different font. It has, uh, the, the navigation is oriented horizontally instead of vertically. It has no background image. And instead of one column, it is three columns. I'm sorry, the other way around. Instead of three columns, it's one column. So let's look at how we do this. First of all, if you, we, we look at the code here, you'll notice that there will be two style sheets for this guy. Actually, I lied. There's actually a third style sheet for this guy. There's two style sheets I created, and they're right here. What's the third style sheet? Well, that little Firefox style sheet that I talked about and that's in the book to make um, older versions of the Firefox browser uh, handle HTML5 a little bit better. This probably should be at the top. So actually, it should be the first style sheet instead of the last style sheet. Notice also we do something a little bit different for IE, previous, and nine, and we'll hold on to that thought for a minute. But if you notice, we have two style sheets here. And the question might be, well, if we have two style sheets, which one of them applies? And the answer is both of them apply. All right? Now, if you notice the first style sheet, there's no media query associated with it. It's just like the style sheets that we have done so far in this class previous to this section. The second style sheet, however, has media equals, and I don't expect you to memorize that per se, but in essence, what this is doing is this is saying, do not apply this style sheet if you're not talking about a computer screen that is at least 601 pixels wide. Yes. Yes. The, the browser knows the browser knows how big of a uh, keep in mind this isn't the yeah, the device size. The browser knows how big the device is in most cases. 
and we'll, we'll back up and talk about that in a second. The first style sheet always applies. The second style sheet sometimes applies. So everyone's getting the first style sheet and then some people are getting the second style sheet. Now the first style sheet, if you imagine, is pretty simple. It's the base style sheet here. And if we look at it, we set a font for the body. We set the header as being a width of 100%. The nav being a width of 100%. The section being a width of 100%. The nav li, I make a display of inline for. That orients them horizontally instead of vertically. And any image inside the section, I set the display to none. What does that mean? It makes them disappear. So if we look at this code here, this image doesn't apply on the mobile version, where we only get the base style sheet. Because in the base style sheet, the display is set to none for that guy. Now, if we look at the second style sheet, you might ask yourself, well, if there's a, two style sheets, which one of them wins? And the answer is, is that where there's a conflict, the second one wins. All right? So it's kind of like we set the, the color to blue, then in the second one we set it to white. Well, that one happened after, so the color's white. The second one wins. So where there's a conflict between these two things, the second one wins. So let's look, for example, at the section image. The first style sheet, the base style sheet, says we're not going to display that image at all. So on a mobile device, where we only get that first style sheet, there's no image to be seen. On a desktop device, though, we first make it invisible, and then the second one makes it visible again. So we do see it. And if you notice what's more, we make the width of it based on a percentage. So the image actually gets bigger and smaller as we resize that, which is something that's critical for mobile development and responsive websites. And if we look down the line and we can compare them, we can see the differences. The base, which is the mobile version of it, simply has a font family of Helvetica and so on. The body of the full version, however, has a different font and it has a background URL. That's why in the browser we get the little pattern in the background, but in the mobile device we don't get a pattern. All right. Oh, what's responsible for the yellow line? I have a rule in here in the base that says any section has a border that's yellow. This, in a nutshell, will take you far as far as mobile web development goes. This isn't every trick of the trade, as they say, and there's more to it. We have a, we have a complete class on mobile web development where we get into more of the in, uh, uh, intricacies of it. But if you know just this, all right, um, you're, you're well on your way to writing responsive websites, websites that, that know where they're being displayed and, and, and are written to sort of accommodate the format that they're displayed. So to review, all right, we're going to do everything based on percentages. We're going to do everything, whether we're talking about the width of columns or the width of images or other media. So we're going to use no absolute numbers for the sizes. We're going to be using percentages. Um, and then we're going to use media queries to progressively enhance a website. That is, we start with sort of a bare bones website and then we add some bells and whistles this way all right, to the more detailed version of the site. All right.
Our next section is on website accessibility. Any questions about the mobile piece? Um, I typically will say if that's a consideration, because again, that's not really the focus of this class. Um, it would be good to practice your skills as far as this goes. So I would suggest, especially given the, the Opera mobile emulator is free, at least take a look at it on the emulator, all right, and, and get a sense of, of what it is. Um, on some assignments, I probably will make that a requirement. It's probably not like a top requirement for uh, the rest of them, though, all right. And again, I encourage all of you to take in spring the mobile web development course all right, to, to, to learn more tricks of the trade. You know, if anything, mobile browsing of the web is going to become even more popular. All right? I mean, it's already uh, pretty popular. I've seen different estimates about like, when folks feel that um, mobile browsing of the web will actually will overtake um, desktop browsing. All right? Okay, accessibility. Accessibility on websites shares a lot of similarities with accessibility in the actual physical world. What are things that help people with disabilities work through the rest of the world, work through the world and, and, and do the things that people without those disabilities can do? What are some things that, that can help those folks? Yes? Ramps, wheelchair ramps, all right? Elevators. Elevators. Braille uh, numbers on doors. Braille numbers on doors. Anything else can help? Wheelchair, right. I'd say you did a good job talking about like how the building design can accommodate that, but let's not forget the fact that there's all sorts of assistive technology as well. The right, the width of the door to accommodate the wheelchair, all right? In general, if you talk about real life, and this applies to the web as well, all right, um, there, there's sort of two things in the mix here um, that, that determine or, or that help people with disabilities just navigate through life. And those two things are assistive technology, so that's things such as screen readers. Um, yeah, in, in webs it's screen readers. In real life it's things such as wheelchairs. And a blind person's cane is assistive technology. All right? Uh, closed captions on, um, on movies, I suppose, is an assistive technology. All right? So... So on one hand, we have the assistive technology. And on the other end, we have a principle that's called universal design. And the principle of universal design works something like this. All right? As great as assistive technology can be, if accommodations for that assistive technology are not built into an environment, the assistive technology is going to be worthless, right? For example, a wheelchair, a great piece of assistive technology, but if there is no elevator up to the second floor, then that wheelchair is not going to do the person any good trying to get up there, all right? That's sort of the, the how do I want to say it? That's sort of the, the, the bad truth or the unfortunate truth of, about this is that any assistive technology can sort of be beaten by bad design, all right? You could have a great wheelchair, well if, the, well, if the door isn't wide enough to let the person in, all right? Again, that assistive technology won't do any good. Now, the notion of universal design is like this, all right? A lot of people would say, you know, this is 
designed for disabilities and all that. Not really. The notion is universal design. And the notion of universal design states this, that accommodations that we make for people with disabilities can often help people that don't have those disabilities. Or at the very least, doesn't really get in their way. All right. The second one's a little simpler to talk about, so we'll, we'll talk about that first. For example, braille on the door. There, there's braille numbers on the door, so if someone is blind, they could tell what room number this is. All right? That helps someone that's blind. Does that affect you at all who is not blind? No. You might not even notice it's there. All right? Likewise, in an elevator, they have braille, or in all sorts of devices, they have braille. It's a big help to people that need it, for the people that don't need it, well, no big deal. It's, it's not like it interferes with you. It's not like I couldn't tell the room number because there was Braille underneath it or something like that. So at the, the worst case scenario is most of universal design doesn't really get in the way of people or the notion of universal design is that what we do for people with disabilities doesn't get in the way with people that don't have those disabilities. And it may also benefit them. Can anyone think of a case of, in an actual physical environment, of something that's done for people with disabilities that can help people that don't have those disabilities? Pardon me? An elevator. How, how so an elevator? How could that help someone without a disability? Pardon me? Right. Yeah. If you're in a hurry, all right, if you're lazy, all right, if you're carting around like I do sometimes, a cart of media items to take to my multimedia class, and it's kind of hard to get it going down the steps. Actually, it's easy to get it down the steps. It's, it's, it's hard to get it down the steps without breaking anything, all right. Um, if, if I had, let's say, a, a, a broken leg. All right, a broken leg doesn't mean I'm disabled, but for the period of time that I'm on crutches and a cast, that assistive technology is going to help me. So we can think of all sorts of cases with universal design. All right, automatic doors. Well, that helps people that are in a wheelchair, sure, but that also might help someone whose arms are full. All right, someone pushing a stroller, all right, for example, and so on. So that's the idea of universal design. The things we're going to do are going to benefit both people with disabilities and people that don't have those disabilities. Or, at the very least, it's not going to be a hindrance to anyone. What disabilities affect people accessing the web? Let's, let's list some of the disabilities that can affect a person's experience accessing the web. Vision is the most obvious one, right? The web is a visual media. You know, we look at our screen and we see stuff. We see all kinds of stuff. And so vision is probably the most obvious one. I will say that a lot of people, when they consider accessibility, that's sort of all they think of, is they think, well, you know, how can we make our sites accessible for the blind? And we'll talk about how we can do that um, in a minute. All right, again. Accessibility is uh, largely assistive technology plus universal design. What's another disability that would affect someone's ability? Yeah. Um, any number of, we'll call this motion control or motor, motor control. All right. And that would include things like arthritis. Um, what is that? Re repetitive stress injury. What, uh, carpal tunnel. All right. Um, that would be that. People with certain neurological uh, disorders, someone that has Parkinson's whose hand shakes a little bit, uh, would have that. Um, and a whole slew of other um, disabilities that, that relate to the ability to move a mouse around or type on a keyboard. That would be another uh disability. What's another one?
Yeah, hearing impaired. Keep in mind when we talk about this, you know, blindness is probably the most dramatic case of this. When we talk about disabilities, that doesn't mean that people can't do anything on the web, right? It just means that certain aspects of the web are difficult for them. Just like someone with a wheelchair, you know. Someone with a wheelchair, once they get in this classroom and get in position, you know, they're a student like everyone else and they can do as well as everyone else. They just need a little bit of special accommodation to get over some of the hurdles that might be in their way just to make it to class. Well, someone that, that is hearing impaired, that doesn't mean that they can't access the web at all. It just means that certain content is difficult for them. Other examples of disabilities. I think we covered probably the most obvious ones, but there's a few a little more subtle ones as well. Okay, that, that, that's an excellent point. Um, language. Differences. And again, that's not per se a disability, but rather an acknowledgement that, you know, it's a global economy. You know, if you're running a business, your goal is to reach as many people as possible. There are people that live in the U.S. that um, speak other languages. So even if you're not talking about an international website, uh, you might want to accommodate those people. Um, that's an excellent point. Um, I, would, I would argue that it sort of fits in here, all right, because sort of the same principles apply. In other words, what do I care if there's a link that says click here for Spanish? All right. I don't speak Spanish, but that's okay. It doesn't bother me that there's a link there that I could click and get a translation for it. So it does sort of support the same goals of universal design. All right. Um, there are ex assistive technologies for this as well. Uh, unfortunately, the assistive technologies aren't very good. What I'm thinking of is like Google Chrome's option to translate a page. You know, translation of a page is done in a very brute force way. And it's funny because I've communicated with people, you know, uh, that, that, that speak English and another language. And they always laugh at, like, if I try to translate something in the other language. Because it doesn't, like, do it right. It sort of does it right, but, like, not really. It loses a lot of the meaning. Okay, simple words, short sentences. There's another aspect of language, though. That, that comes into play that, that I would count, count as a disability. Any thoughts? Dyslexia, exactly. All right. What is dyslexia? That's something that, that is, is not really completely understood by people. Um, that would be one, that would be one instance of it where you like see a word backwards or you invert letters. So it's not like someone that's dyslexic like sees every every word backwards. It's that, for example, they may switch two letters where you would read cat, they would see CTA or something like that. Or it may be that they switch letters. In other words, a lowercase b and a lowercase d are very similar. Right? I mean, the one is just the other one turned around, all right? They may switch those letters as well. So there's a variety of different forms of dyslexia, but yeah, that's absolutely uh, a, 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 an example. Other examples? Yes? ADD. Yeah, a, a, ADD or ADHD. Uh, 
yeah, any sort of cognitive disability would fit in there as, as well. But ADHD is a good one, right? Um, there's, a, there, there's one actually, um, if you ever play video games, you might see warnings at the beginning of the video game about, yeah, about seizures and epilepsy. Certain sort of screen flashes can actually trigger seizures. And, um, well, we'll talk about the implication of that um, going forward. But that, that's another one. Um, there's two other, uh, there, there, there might be more, all right? These are, I think, the big ones, if my memory serves. I do have a PowerPoint presentation uh, that I gave to faculty several years back that, that's online. Um, I, I don't give it in class because I don't like to give PowerPoint presentations. All right, I, I decided I'm going to do my best to avoid ever giving a PowerPoint presentation again for the rest of my life. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, but there's two other ones that, that come to mind. One is, or, and I don't know if they, these are separate or these kind of catch-all categories, but age-related conditions. Another way is sort of milder versions of all of these. So, for example, an older person may not be blind, but they probably also don't have the best eyesight. You know, you know I definitely have, have that case. An older version may not be deaf, but they probably don't have the best hearing. An older person may not have dramatic motion control issues, but they might have some arthritis, some soreness, difficult to get in position of mouse and very precisely, and so on. All right? An older person may not have some of those cognitive disabilities, but might be more easily distracted or have trouble focusing and all that. All right? Likewise, there's milder versions of these, even whether you're talking about younger or older pe a person that, that uh, comes in uh, to play. Again, you may not be blind, but you might have bad vision even if you're a younger person. You may not be blind, but you might be colorblind. All right? And so on down the line. There's also situational conditions that are like these. For example, hearing impaired. Well, in our lab, we don't have speakers. All right? So, well, none of, well, well, uh, well, a person may not be hearing impaired in that environment, unless you brought headphones with you, you can't hear with the school, with anything that's said. So, that's a situational case of, yeah, you, you know, people, you know, a person may not be hearing impaired, but they still can't hear the audio. M motion control. You may not have some permanent condition, but you might, might have broken your arm. All right? You have your arm in a cast. And so on with all of these where there's sort of situational things that cause this. It may not be ADHD, but you might be very distracted on a given day. You know, if you have a lot going on, you know, in your life, and, and, and you know, you might be distracted. All right? So let's keep all these in mind, because our next step, or one of our next steps, is going to be to focus on what we can do to help folks that have these conditions. And in doing so, we're going to apply the rules of universal design. That is, the things, the accommodations that we're going to put are either going to be neutral to people without those disabilities or actually benefit them, at least in some cases. Let's talk briefly about assistive technology. Probably the most clear case of assistive technology is what's called a screen reader or screen narrator. And what that does is that actually reads the screen to a person who is visually impaired. Let's see if I can get this going in here. Let me open. 
open up. We look under control panel. There are I saw every version of Windows renames everything and puts it in a different place. Ease of Access Center. Always in this section. Let's go and let's start the narrator. Initialized Microsoft Narrator window. Focused on quick contains start button. Location bar. Desktop 99%. Microsoft Narrator location bar. Desktop backslash all control panel items backslash e start okay, on screen on, keyboard button. This page up. Tool tip. Set up high contrast button. Tab. Start magnifier button. Start narrator button. Responsive web design location bar. Desktop backslash all control panel items backslash setup high contrast button. Tab. Tab. Start magnifier button. Tab. Tab. Down arrow. Down arrow. I'm not too familiar with this, but essentially what it's doing start on screen keyboard button is it is Enter. narrating the screen Enter. Enter. caps lock on and certain keys caps lock off do certain things that start I magnifier am. button that I my own lack of knowledge start about exactly start up set up high it. contrast increases the contrast in colors to reduce eye strain and make things easier to read to turn it on press left shift plus left alt plus print screen exit narrator window focus okay. on yes button contains yes button no button are you sure you want to exit narrator It's very difficult to imagine using a using technology like this. Now, this is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, um, this is like the this is like the standard one that ships with Windows. Typically, people that are visually impaired, they they many times if if it's available, they can they can purchase a better uh, version of that 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 works through. And you may think it would be very difficult, and, and I'm sure it is. However, it amazes me to see. Um, you know, uh, what people can do when they have to, all right? I worked with a, uh, a young high school student years ago. We, we both were, uh, I had a faculty fellowship and she was a high school intern at NASA's um, Glenn Research Center. And she was blind. And, I mean, I would get lost at NASA Glenn because, I mean, it's a, conf it's a big place and it's confusing, all right? And yet she navigated her way around probably as well as I did, all right? And there used to be a guy here at LC that filled the vending machines that was blind. And, you know, he did go around, he'd do his job, and, you know, he, he would navigate his way through all this, even though, again, you know, big campus, sometimes I get confused about that. The blind girl that was an intern, that's how she accessed the screen. I mean, she had a better screen reader than the, the built-in one, but that's how she accessed the screen, and that's how she did everything. And she made Word documents, PowerPoint presentations, she surfed the web, she chatted with her friends in IM instead of working. I mean, she did everything that anyone else would do on the computer uh, doing that. On occasion, she would call me over and ask me what, the, what her screen said because I got confused or the page was poorly designed or something like that. So once in a while, I mean, we're talking about maybe once a week, maybe not even that. And it was, it was odd coming in because I'm sort of 
Uh, if you haven't gathered by now, sort of a late riser. You know, I dash in <laughs> like a minute before nine here uh, uh, to class. So I would always get in later than her. And when I came in, the office would be dark. The office room would be dark. Her monitor would be off. And she would be sitting there typing away. It, it, was, it was uncanny to think that they could do that. So although that sounds like a very awkward way to navigate through a website, you know, what other choice does someone in that position have? You know? Yeah, there also is talk to text. All right, there is speech recognition that could help that. Um, the key... All right, so, so yeah, so, so that is going. Do keep in mind, again, if you are blind, you can't use a mouse, right? They do have, I believe, something like that. They also have a screen to braille device that that will show uh, that will show uh, uh, that will show the braille of of Texas on the screen. Uh, I, I've I've seen those as well. I'm not sure if they have a braille keyboard. I think a typical keyboard works for that. As long as you have, yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a, yeah on the. On the F and the J, there's a little that little mark that indicates those are your home I keys. Two years. <laughs> well, I I I can't type very well at all. So, but yeah, for people that touch type, you know, they look they're just typing away um, and, and going. So that's an example of assistive technology for for that. Um, there are. Other examples, there is, for example, building the windows. And again, by no means are these the, the end-all, be-all, but there's a magnifier. Oh, yeah? That's cool. And what this does is this magnifies the screen. There we go. I launched it by going here. And again, you can go forward and backward. In addition, most browsers and most applications these days have a, a zoom capability. So that sort of alleviates the need for this. But just in case it doesn't, or if you're looking at an image or something and you need a closer look, you can do the magnifier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's the same way. I'm still getting used to the two finger gestures as well. Uh, they actually are very cool once you master them. Um, uh, but but yeah, I do the same thing. Or or I will like I don't know if I like if I'm like hovering my other finger or if maybe I just let it rest. But yeah, a lot of times I hit the two finger uh, in, instead of doing that. Um, and of course, on mobile devices, you have all the pinch gestures, and you know that way to make it bigger, this way to make it smaller, and so on. Another thing they have for people that have uh, uh, mobility issues is there's an on-screen keyboard actually had a student that was uh, confined to a wheelchair and really had a, a lot of problems uh, not just moving her arms but or not just moving her legs but moving her arms and she was able to type via this so she was it was easier for her to use the mouse than it was for her to, to use all ten fingers on the keyboard Oh yeah, right. 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 I mean, the the most dramatic case of that, I'm at, and I'm actually reading his uh, biography right now with Stephen Hawking. Yeah, uh, that that can through eye motion, I believe, because I mean, I don't I don't think he moves his hands. I think through facial motions, he's able to to go uh, and do that. So it's amazing about what can be done for that. Now. 
But that's only one part of the story. And I'm sure we could probably think about uh, other pieces as well. If we go to YouTube... All right. So, we're on. God, that, there's nothing more painful than to hear your own voice. I'll tell you. I, I know you guys are thinking no is more painful to hear your voice. All right, but turn on captions will go. But this is at best an imprecise thing. Where'd they go? So, for example, where'd it go? All right. So, where it we're going. on to discuss. Class with basic, um, you know, introductory to the class and how the class is going to work and, and so on. And And we'll then spend the last half starting to get into uh, what makes for a Java application. What makes for a dollar application. I'm sure I did not you, say you, that. You, you, um, may you, you, you may notice when a little bit, when, of, an uh, room, uh, a little bit of an unusual room are lectures. YouTube. Um, that was room, not that room. That gives you an opportunity if you gives want to review something, again, to review you something review again. You can if you're review or in order to get out of town, out of town or whatever, and you need, or to, whatever miss you class, need to miss a class. You can class. always just watch the video. You can always just so watch I, the video, I so I post some, usually, the some, get posted, usually you know, like two-step posted, so you know, later that evening um, by you 10 o'clock. If I am so, exhausted, again, and this is a case I'm of assistive technology to, that um, it is available, uh, but it is not particularly uh, refined. Yeah, you, because maybe right, you, you might, yeah, you might be able to figure out some of those things uh, so anyway, that, uh, that's why we're uh, in just here. by the context uh, you and, do have and, those little buttons, and so on. Uh, in so uh, again, it helps. I mean, the the thing is, is you know, nothing can. And your uh, or, you know, it, it's going to be very difficult, but again, no it's assistive technology, it helps. Classes I've ever All right. Ever push one of those buttons on next purpose. week, what we're going to do, or not like next week, but next class, what we're going to do is we're going to consider the yeah. idea of universal design and apply them to each of the cases. In yeah, other words, right. what can we do for a person that's blind? What can we do for a person that's deaf? What can we do for a person with motor control issues? And we'll run down that list and talk about what we can do in our design that uh, can make those people's lives easier. Because again, I probably know about building that. designers, you know, got to make the, bo the doors big enough for wheelchairs to fit through. Otherwise, the assistive technology of a wheelchair isn't going to do any good. Well, similar thing with, with some of these uh, other disabilities as well. We have to do our part as designers, too, to accommodate these people's needs. All right. We'll see you up in lab. David Johnny Kincaid?